We talk a lot about equality, but the fact is that when we are born inherently because of our various social locations and identities, some of us are just born with more of an advantage and some of us are inherently born with more of a disadvantage. And so people who can really recognize that and work to create more of a level playing field, so to speak, (laughs) or work towards creating that, it's just, it's amazing. You're listening to the Almost 30 Podcast, hosted by Krista Williams and Lindsay Simsek. Almost 30 started as a conversation about the transition from our 20s to our 30s. But then we realized life is full of transitions. So we expanded our mission. We are an intuition-led, wellness-focused lifestyle podcast that promises to deliver authentic conversations, diverse points of view, and insights rooted in optimism, growth, and intention. The Almost 30 Nation community is a group of purposeful dreamers who are smart, passionate, and always seeking the full potential in every aspect of their lives. At Almost 30, we're making magic together. We dream it, and then we do it. Thanks so much for tuning into the Almost 30 Podcast. Here we go. Hello, hello. It's us, Lindsay and Krista of the Almost 30 Podcast. Thanks for joining us. This is a special Friday treat for you all. We were live at the Propel Collabs Fitness Festival in Los Angeles this summer, the fourth year of one of the biggest fitness festivals out there. It was such a blast. And we got to interview some of the most incredible people. Yeah, we love Propel Collabs because it's a place where we can all learn, grow, inspire, and celebrate fitness and wellness together. At Almost 30 Podcast, we are all about coming in community to learn and grow and inspire one another. So it was a perfect alignment of our two brands. We were lucky enough to interview leaders in fitness and all of our mind, body, health, and wellness, and are excited to bring you this series powered by Propel. Today's interview is with Lauren Ash. Lauren Ash is a wellness visionary, yoga and meditation guide, sought after speaker and writer, and founder and executive director of the culture shifting lifestyle brand, synonymous with Black women's wellness, Black Girl in Ohm. This interview was powerful and insightful, and we loved talking to Lauren. So please enjoy this episode. We're excited to have our first conversation with Lauren here with you today, this afternoon, and we would love to welcome her on stage. We have the founder of Black Girl and Ohm, Lauren Ash. Woo! We're all we're Hello. very coordinated today, which is amazing. <laughs> yes, we we only slightly planned it, <laughs> honestly. So I'd love to talk about your impact you've had in the wellness space, and you have such a heart centered approach to everything you do, and I think that's what makes you stand out, and that's what makes Black Girl and Ohm so different. Can you talk a little bit about the beginning of Black Girl and Ohm and where you got the idea to start it? Absolutely, I'm really excited to to talk about this. I love telling the the story of the journey, especially for those who are like young and creative and you have perhaps a vision and you're like, how the heck do I amplify this, right? For me, I it all happened very organically. So I had been practicing yoga for a few years. I first gravitated towards the practice because I was a stressed out grad student. So I did not sign up because it was like cute or popular. I was signing up for very practical reasons to classes at my local yoga studio because I noticed all the embodied tension I was holding in my body. A lot of the work that I was doing as a grad student was also very intense, like beautiful, but intense. I studied Black feminism. I studied a lot about Black culture. And I was just noticing how much I was kind of weighed down in my spirit by a lot of it. And so I started practicing. And of course, I fell in love with it, (laughs) of course. And I even took a yoga for transformation series where I dove into the eight limbs of yoga and realized the philosophy and the spirituality and the really rich history behind this practice that oftentimes gets attention just because of the physical postures, right? And how fit or toned or whatever you can get from it. But I was like, this is a whole, a whole just expansive um, spiritual tradition as well. So fast forward, you know, it had been about three years of practicing consistently. Um, I found myself in Chicago very serendipitously. I had moved to Chicago and I found myself also really disillusioned with just this idea of a traditional career that I was really trying but struggling to to grasp. And so 
that disillusionment wound me up in in terms of uh, committing to a yoga teacher training. I was not signing up to become a yoga teacher. I also I always tell people that like that was not a part of my vision. I was simply really deepening my own practice, you know, and and curious about what that would spark for me. And I literally signed up the day that yoga teacher training began. I'm a Sagittarius and very spontaneous, so that's very normal for me. And that first week was when I received all of these downloads about Black Girl and Ohm. Like literally in a yoga practice, I received the phrase Black Girl in Ohm. So that wasn't something that I conceived of later and, you know, brainstorm like, what is the name of this platform going to be? It was just like, it came to me and I wrote it down. And I really started at that point a more intentional manifestation practice. I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time, but I know that now looking back. So I really was dwelling on, okay, what is Black Girl in Ohm? You know? And I realized that it could be this way for me to merge together my passion for holistic wellness, Uh, my passion for yoga in particular, with my love of cultivating intentional sisterhood with other Black women. You know, that was something that was huge for me and really caused me to be so uplifted um, throughout my graduate studies as well. Like I formed really intentional relationships with two people who are like my closest friends to this day. And I knew from experiences that I had in undergrad uh, where I really experienced more overt racism for the first time that I also had this like deep empathy for creating like really intentional spaces for, as we say within Black Girl and Own, for us to breathe easy, right? So it just grew from there. I mean, after yoga teacher training, I started hosting um, Black Girl and Own yoga <laughs> sessions in the, in the living room of uh, a really good friend and now mentor of mine's apartment. So when people are also like, oh, how do you get started? I'm like, start in your friend's house. Like, <laughs> really, you know? I did not know many people in the city that I was at at the time. I was just in there for... um, I was just in Chicago for about a year at that point. And so I think I started it with like maybe 50 Instagram followers. And I was like, come through. And people did. And you know, fast forward, it's almost 5 years later. We also have a a podcast. We reached over a million downloads last year. We have an online publication with just... I don't even know how many people visit the site. But we share resources about what it means to be well and sustained and thrive, honestly, as women of color. We also have ongoing um, experiences in the way of like self care Sunday experiences and retreats. And it's just been something that has grown into this really beautiful global sisterhood and like wellness movement that really centers women of color in the conversation about healing, self care, self empowerment, and self love. And it's just been a beautiful journey. Yeah, it's beautiful to think that the entity of Black Girl and Ohm found you. And it's almost all you have to do is is get out of the way and be that conduit for its energy and what it wants to bring to the world. And it, it, it is like a sense of peace. You know, you don't have to exert too much. It's the allowing. So that's really beautiful. Ease. Yeah. Ease. Yeah. But I mean, there are moments I'm sure you all can relate where you're just, you're trying to like, you know, put on all the pressure, put on what you think it should be, how you think it should go, or other people are telling you that. So it's a constant practice, I can imagine. Absolutely. So we know that there is a problem in mainstream wellness. Um, there is a lack of diversity across the board. And I just, you know, I admire and respect your brand so much in the sense that it is uh, giving, you know, women of color an opportunity to see themselves, you know? And so w- what is the importance there? And, and can you educate us on where this is happening and not happening within the wellness industry. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so incredible. Thinking back to 2014 when I got started, I have no doubt that there were phenomenal women of color leading spaces and initiatives and yoga classes and all that stuff for women of color and mine. But it, I did not see it in this broader way. Like I did not have access to it. Like if I would Google for it, I wouldn't find it. You know what I mean? So that's why I started it. And fast forward to now, there has been so much power for work done. And it's beautiful too, because Black Girl Know has kind of been a magnet and an umbrella that has like brought a bunch of people who should have been in conversation, who should have been connected together. So I see it. I see a lot of work towards like more equity and justice within the wellness space being done by a lot of individuals who are Black and Brown folk who have had either experiences that were just, you know, again, overt discrimination, 
that really like me, like lit a fire and was like, no, we got to really, we got to really do something. And then I see a lot of really awesome work being done with allies. Like, I think it's so crucial to like affirm that it can't just be marginalized folk who are doing the work to, you know, center more of us within the wellness space. It absolutely has to be allies, like white allies um, and, and folk just with more power and privilege in general working together. And so I've been personally so positively benefited and from and also in relationship with um, specific allies. And I just want to shout them out because I think they're fantastic humans. So uh, Caitlin Rogers uh, Perez, she and her um, business partner, Rashida Graham Washington, have this phenomenal initiative that's developing right now called Sweet Rest. And Caitlin is a white woman and an ally and Rashida is a black woman and has done a lot of work within the justice and faith movement. And they've come together to create a platform that provides sweet rest, basically rejuvenating experiences for black women. So Caitlin, you know, as a white woman has identified, I have certain access to wealth and to power. And I want to use that to both dismantle white supremacy and, and also provide access for black women who are doing phenomenal work in the community and who are always going, right? Like always, always going to just sit down <laughs> and be. And that is a radical act, you know? And so for the two of them, I feel like the model that they've created and Black Girl we're partnering them in very exciting ways in the future, including providing two sabbatical sweet rests, like month-long sabbaticals for Black women. So that'll be announced during our five-year anniversary this November. I also really love the work that um, Ellie Burrows, she's the co-founder of Mindful. It's a really phenomenal meditation studio in New York City. She's another example of an ally who has provided specifically space. Like, I don't think people realize how radical it is that if you have space to provide, again, for someone who is from a marginalized background, who doesn't have access, wealth, capital, like just providing someone space, you know what I mean? To host a wellness session, to come together and have, again, a safe space to breathe easy, a safe space to be, that is a radical act. And she has given me space. She has trained me. I got trained in Vedic meditation with her last month and it has changed my life. Providing it, not thinking about it like a donation, but in thinking of it like a, you may otherwise not get to have this or the rate that someone might be offering this to you is the rate that they would also offer someone who has more wealth and who has more access. And that doesn't even make sense, you know? And that to me is about is about equity. Like we talk a lot about equality, but the fact is that when we are born inherently because of our various social locations and identities, some of us are just born with more of an advantage and some of us are inherently born with more of a disadvantage. And so people who can really recognize that and work to create more of a level playing field, so to speak, <laughs> or work towards creating that... It's just, it's amazing. So yeah, I look, I, I mentioned Sweet Rest and I mentioned Ellie because I feel like both the, the connection of, of allyship with um, Rashida and with Caitlin and Sweet Rest and then Ellie realizing, again, her, the, the, the space that she can provide and the training that she can provide is just absolutely essential in terms of models that we can look to about what's possible. That's beautiful. And we've done a little bit of the work, but it's been some of the most powerful transformative transformative opportunities for me as a person, you know, in my life. So highly recommend. I wanted to ask you about self-care and rest. You know, you're talking about getting these women sabbaticals for a month. So what is the power you've seen of self-rest, self-care and rest in your life and then with other black women? I love this question. I okay. Love a good so self-care <laughs> moment. Yes. At the top of this year, y'all, I went on this phenomenal retreat in Bali. It was a manifestation retreat for women of color. And it was right around the new year. So, you know, I'm huge on intention setting. I'm huge. Like I live by intentions as much as possible. I'm always setting a new one with the new moon, but I also always create one at the top of the year. And what I really was receiving through all these experiences that we were doing on retreat was that my words, my concepts for 2019 were rejuvenation and regeneration. So that's why I'm just like, ooh, I love talking about rest because <laughs> that's so resonant with the ideas of rejuvenation and regeneration. So literally, rest is everything. I want to also shout out a really powerful platform called the NAP Ministry. <laughs> Into it. Yes. So it was founded by a Black woman. Unfortunately, I don't remember her name, but it's an Instagram page and an overall movement. It's literally all about taking naps and sitting down and resting. And for, again, marginalized people, specifically 
I'm a Black woman. I can only speak to my experience. We are so conditioned and so socialized to go, 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 to work harder because, you know, in some cases we have to in order to get experiences that others might get for, you know, we just have to work. We have to work harder. And also, just when you think about like the history too of Black women in terms of our relationship with labor and providing for others and being of service to others, and that being passed along intergenerationally, we had a quick little chat about intergenerational everything right before this. And it's like, those things literally get passed down, right? And so I have to literally, as a Black woman, especially as a Black woman who is leading a movement that is all about self-care, I have to model the kinds of like the kinds of ways of being and the kinds of consciousness that I think more of us have to in order to be freer and in order to like love ourselves and love others more. So for me, rest looks like... So I I, I love this. I really... This year, I committed to taking like quarterly, week-long um, spiritual retreats. And that can look different. It could look like an official retreat or me just like turning everything off for a week, right? And even the the fact that that sounds so radical. Like people are like, oh, every quarter, like a week off. And you know, and for me, it took me a while to get there. I recently revisited a journal of mine from 2015 where I wrote down that I wanted to do that. Here we are in 2019 and I finally am in both a, p- a position to do that. And also I feel like I deserve it. You know what I mean? And that is a huge thing too for any of us who are like struggling with the idea of taking time for ourselves. Whatever that looks like, a nap or a vacation that's truly a vacation. Because <laughs> a lot of times we go on vacations, we're still plugged in. Something wrong with that. But if you feel like you're always plugged in, you do need to take a break from the screen, right? You do take, need to take a, a break from the content, whatever. But for me to also just know that I can do it and also I'm deserving of it, that's really powerful. You know, Not because I have worked hard, but just because I, as a being need to give that to myself. And that giving that to myself and pouring into myself in that way allows me to give to other people. I really love Lisa Nichols, really powerful motivational speaker, a Black woman as well. And she always talks about giving from the overflow. So not giving from this place of of deficit, of course, but not even giving from a place of like, I just have enough. Let me give that to you. No, like literally I'm pouring into myself and I am then joyful to give to other people because I have so much to give. And that to me can only come from giving myself really rejuvenating, restorative experiences as much as possible every day. I have a really like beautiful, long morning ritual. And I have to remind myself on those days where I want to cut it short or I feel like I can't, but that is exactly why I need to. (laughs) Again, giving from the overflow. Yeah, you mentioned the deserving of the self-care. I'd love to know like what... What stories have you had to kind of rewrite or detangle surrounding self care or anything at all? You know, we all have our stories. So I just love to know what work you've done around that. I legit love these questions. Thanks. I'm like obsessed. We with should these do questions. this for our job. <laughs> we <should>. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, unconditional love and support and rewiring. And I'm literally in this state right now, rewiring what I was living by for 30 years of my life, which was that I um, was loved conditionally, both by other people in my life. So they loved me for what I was doing or providing to them. And also I could only love myself and only give to myself if I was doing X, Y, Z. And usually X, Y, Z were unrealistic expectations. And this was another realization that I had when I was in Bali. So I'm always going to talk about Bali, (laughs) y'all. Because it changed my life. But you know, sometimes if you plan to maybe give yourself something, you're like, this is going to be when I focus on forgiveness or this is going to be when I focus on like my fitness or whatever. But sometimes when you set that intention, the universe will just start giving it to you a little early because it's like, okay, you said you wanted to do this. So before I went on the retreat, I already started to get hints of unconditional love and support being a big thing that I was going to start owning and practicing. Literally the day that I flew to Bali, I get on the phone with my best friend. We were having a heart to heart. You know, sometimes with your best friend, you got to take a little break. This was, this was us coming back together after a break. She was like, I can't let you go all the way to Asia without us really coming together again. And she was like, Lauren, I've really realized that every time that we're together, I notice that you're always trying to do something for me. You're always giving me something, trying to teach me something. She's like, I don't need you to do all that. <laughs> She's like, all I need you to do is be yourself and affirm me. 
That's all I need. And it's such a beautiful thing. Me, who I am now, looks at that and I'm just like, she was literally just letting me know that she loves me unconditionally and she wants me to love her unconditionally. But in that moment, I literally was devastated. And I didn't know why. I didn't have language for it. I didn't know why and why that feeling arose in me. But I literally like felt internally like off. And on the phone, I was just like, okay, girl, yeah. But I was like going through it inside. I get to Bali. Um, on the first day, um, before the retreat even started, <laughs> I'm like walking around trying to find breakfast. And I overhear this father talking with his daughter. She had to have been five years old. And all I hear from the conversation was him telling her, always remember that you are not loved for what you do, you're loved for who you are. And I like, I was so emotional. <laughs> like, it felt like he was talking to me and it felt like he was my dad. And I actually have like a very complicated relationship with my dad historically. And so it was also like a message that I think, you know, you talk about healing the inner child. I feel like my inner child, like young little Lauren, needed to hear that message too. And in that moment, I did not connect at all that moment with what my best friend had told me literally 24 hours prior. I had no connection made. So <laughs> we're at the first like dinner of the retreat and they're talking about how much unconditional love and support is going to be what we focus on. So I'm getting like emotional. I'm like, okay, this is clearly a message for me, right? And one of the first activities that we did on retreat was calling into mind a moment in our lives where we can always think back on to know that we are unconditionally loved and supported. So I was all ready. I was like, yes, like we're supposed to draw a symbol of this moment. I had my markers out. I had my paper out. I was like, yes. And then I sat there and I realized that nothing was coming to mind. And then the things that would come to mind to me in that moment were only connected to things that I had done for people. So I was like, okay, well, they showed up for me in this way, but that's because I did this. And then I was like really, again, emotional. Um, Carlene, the person leading the activity, was like, everyone done? And I hadn't even thought of a moment yet. I eventually did think of a moment. It was with my best friend. And it was like really heartwarming. But I was still really struggling with the fact that it took me so long to even think of a moment, right? Because I knew on an intellectual level that I am unconditionally loved and supported by many of my close friends and family. Like They don't expect anything from me. They don't want me to be anything else other than who I am in this moment and who I was when they first met me, right? But something, something was like troubling me about why it took me so long. And I had a major realization over the course of the retreat that when I was young, you know, being a deeply creative child and my parents channeling me into all these activities and theater and voice lessons and all this stuff, I was oftentimes on stage, you know, I mean, much like I am now. Um, and that the celebration and the affirmation that I would receive afterwards, I translated that into they love who I'm being in terms of a performing sense. They love what I'm giving them in that performance and not... They could care less. I could have gone up there and sang crazy or like flubbed all the lines or not done this activity at all and just been myself and like not done anything. And they would have still loved me. So it was a major realization. So it was two things. Number one, me then starting to lean into the love that has been around me and not thinking that it's something else, them expecting something from me, right? And then also me giving myself unconditional love, which means doing things for myself just because. You know what I mean? Just because. Amen. That was really powerful too because I was thinking through of the condition out of the conditionality because I've thought about that a lot in my life with my parents and my relationships and that was something that recently I uncovered, you know, understanding what that meant and that that relates a lot to your life and I think for a lot of us we can kind of think through different situations with our parents and that's when we talk about the ancestral piece of situations or conversations that you've had that still stick with you today and still impact decisions you make at all times. You know, for you, that was conditionality in your relationships, like with your best friend saying that and then, you know, realizing. And it's so beautiful too that you saw the dad and the daughter at that moment as a healing, as a healing modality for you. So that, very that is much so was. beautiful. I love that. Okay. On the self-care piece, just a second question to that. What is preventative self-care? Yeah. Preventative self-care is for me, knowing I want to make sure that I'm sustained tomorrow. So I'm going to do this for me today. I'm not going to wait until I'm exhausted. I'm not going to wait until I'm in desperate need. I'm not going to wait until I'm feeling depressed or anxious. Right now, to set myself up, I'm going to pour into me. And that also requires a level of awareness, right? It's like paying attention to our patterns, paying attention to our triggers. For me, it's like, 
I know that if I don't check myself from the amount of time that I spend on social media, just like scrolling, not like creating content and sharing something, but like just being on there to be on there, that that is going to make me feel a way that I don't want to feel. You know what I mean? So it's like I set up the screen time on my phone (laughs) because I want to make sure that like I get at least a reminder, right? Um, Or for me, it's um, also like really knowing that I have to lovingly force myself to be vulnerable with my friends. I have a tendency to hold space for other people and not hold space for myself. So I have to like, when my friend actually asks me how I'm doing, remember again, okay, she loves you unconditionally. So she's actually asking you from a place of deep love and care, not just going through the motions like a lot of us do. We ask, how are you? You know, it's just like a rhythm that we do. So I need to actually be like, you know, I'm feeling this today, you know, and not necessarily knowing that I'm going to receive anything other than a listening ear in that moment. Um, But that that's also phenomenal to receive. Someone who can actually hear me and hold whatever it is that I have. So yeah, it's really key that we all pay attention to our patterns and to our triggers because then that allows us to know what to set up in terms of the preventative self-care. You know, I stray away from telling people what they should do in terms of self-care because we all have wildly different journeys. Some of us... Yoga is our everything. It releases, it uplifts, it empowers. Some people, that's never going to actually be what allows them to feel cared for. You know, it might be a walk. It's so simple, but it can be so released. We were talking about walking earlier too. Like it can be everything, right? So really paying attention to what you need and then setting yourself up to receive that in a sustainable way. Yeah, on that, I mean, it's so interesting. I think just by nature, we we want to nurture and give and the receiving kind of comes second. And it's a thing that we really have to learn how to do. So in that receiving, creating a sisterhood around you to support that ability to receive, to, to exchange the energy of love, of support, of creativity. How How have you been able to do that for yourself? And how do you you know, teach others to do that in a way that feels authentic to them? Because not everyone is a social being, but they want community. So what are unique ways that you've been able to do that? Yeah. So cultivate sisterhood. I love this. Again, I think everything starts with intention for me. So if you are desiring like nourishing relationships, particularly sisterhood, right? Thinking about, okay, well, what is it that I need? What is it that I require in a relationship to feel loved and cared for? You know, because different kinds of friendships serve serve different kinds of purposes. And I think that's okay. You know, so thinking like, what is it that I need? And then giving that to yourself first. You know, I've been reading this book, Calling in the One. Sounds very cheesy. (laughs) Uh, I'm getting it tomorrow. (laughs) What is this? I've actually heard it's good. We've heard of it. Yes, Yes. Yes. So, um, I forget the author, but it's basically a, a book that's all about calling, that's all about expanding your capacity to love and be loved, right? One of the activities in it, she has you identify the things that you desire in a partner or actually need in a partner to feel loved. And then, spoiler alert, the activity is giving that to yourself. So she has you write all these affirmations where it's not just about that person in the future giving this to you, but like you yourself giving that to you. And that just like opened my eyes, you know? It was like, oh, wow, because there's a power of, attracting then that energy into your life once you start giving that to yourself, you know? So if you desire a a sister, a friend who is um, a companion in your life, you know, to share life experiences with you, start doing those life experiences. If you have it on your board to like take a quarterly retreat or to sign up for a yoga session, but you feel like a lot, a lot of times we can feel timid about doing things like that by ourselves, do it, do it, like literally do it. You're going to learn so much about yourself. And then when that person is attracted into your life, you're going to be able to enjoy it in a way that's not contingent on just the fact that like you're doing it with the friend, but you're doing it because you love it and they're doing it because they love it and you get to share that experience together. So yeah, my, my close sisters and I definitely have a lot of similar values. And it started out with me getting clear on my values first. Yeah, that's beautiful about the love thing. You know, it is your capacity to love and that love is available to you at all times, you know, within you. and. Um, That's really beautiful. So looking forward, what are you looking forward to in 2019, 2020 for yourself and Black Girl and all? Yes. I am looking forward to 
elevating everything that I'm doing now. You know, when I think about 20 is funny, I'm like, ooh, that's just a great number right there. <laughs> so um, I really love guiding meditations. I think as my own meditation practice has deepened, my my excitement to guide them just is heightened. And again, the attraction piece, like I've been attracting more meditation experiences the more that I've deepened into my practice. So it's so beautiful. Like I haven't sought them out. It's just happened. Um, so I'm looking forward to producing even more audio meditations that are really rooted in topics and thematics that I feel like I just... Again, Black Girl Home, I started it because I needed it. I'm going to be creating these audio meditations on themes that I feel like the world needs more of. Um, and I already have a few and I just have seen so much how they've resonated with people. Um, I'm looking forward to hosting my first retreat in the spring of 2020. So I'll be sharing details about that as soon as it is ready. <laughs> but um, and it's like really my first destination retreat because I have a host of retreats on a local level, but it's like in a really beautiful place. And it's going to be really centered on writing and self-care because my own journaling practice has been so essential to my well-being and to my um, just sustainability, my growth. And it really changed a lot during my birthday month last year <laughs> when my best friend gifted me a journal and she was like, this is your feelings journal. She's like, I know you're all about manifestation, you like writing down what you want to attract, but you're running away from your feelings. Like You need to really own your emotions and honor them. And so once I started really just also writing down the things that I wasn't as comfortable acknowledging, that literally changed me. And I want to invite more people into how profound that practice can be as well. So that's going to be a central part of that retreat experience. Um, I am slowly but surely working on my first book as well. And so whenever that is ready to be birthed, you know, I'm not pressure, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it, but it is a process that has been really revealing. And I've realized that for me, like Storytelling is such a way that I connect with people and storytelling is such a way that I heal as well. So this journey of writing this book is deeply healing to me. And I know that it will also heal a lot of other people, especially Black women, because that's always my, my main community. So. I was wondering when the book was coming. So Yeah, I mean, I'm me so too. Excited. <laughs> yes, honestly. It's in development though. Yes. Take your time. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Timing so. is always divine. Yes. yes. Thank yes. you for being here. Thank we you love so you. Much. And she's new to LA, so she will be here. <laughs> um, you can follow Lauren at, at Black Girl in Ohm. And it's just such a beautiful community and we admire it so much just as we build our community. So we we thank you for being so open thank and you. honest. Yeah. All right. Thanks, for guys. Yeah. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to the Almost 30 Podcast live at Propel Collabs this summer in LA. We will see you on the next one. You can connect with us at almost30podcast.com and almost30podcast on Instagram.